you start with your name and job title, please? Raph Nicholson, freelance women's cricket journalist. Raph, we are going to go through every single uh, World Cup team uh, from this latest World Cup, and you are going to give us everything we need to know about these teams. I know you, you're absolutely gagging to tell us all the information you have on Pakistan and Bangladesh uh, teams. You've just got reams of notes that the Guardian didn't take. And, you you know, so many takes, so many views. It's going to be all in. Uh, let's start with Ireland. Ireland do not win a game in this World Cup from four attempts. I thought that times they batted very well. Um, the game against England was maybe some of the worst bowling I've ever seen in a Cricket World Cup. <laughs> Um, I don't know what happened there. Outside of that, I actually thought they bowled quite well. All the Prendergast, I talked about her before. You know, it was obvious that she was a different level of talent. When I watched her in the tournament, she could bat, she could bowl, she could field. And I was suddenly like, this is a potential proper star going into the future. Uh, Gabby Lewis was okay. Maybe, uh, I know she's, I think she's scored the most runs that any Island woman's ever scored at a World Cup. Um, but I think she could be better than that. Outside of that, there's a couple of players where I'm like, we need to develop a little bit, you know, uh, move on a little bit within the women's game uh, in Ireland. And they definitely need to play more cricket. They, they messed up the DRS in one of their games as well, didn't they? When they didn't seem to actually understand what DRS is. And I tell you what, we can excuse um, players from, a, I was going to say associate. I, 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 that's my other question. Are they associate or not in women's cricket? Because it's so confusing because they have played a test, but they don't play tests. Um, but we can excuse, uh, you know, um, teams like that. But if, I can't excuse an Ireland team for not understanding DRS because surely... <laughs> <laughs> of all the countries, they should know more about it than anyone else. Uh, tell me about Ireland. Okay, well, they were going into this World Cup kind of on a bit of a high um, because of the recent professionalisation, and I think that's really important. Um, and that means that players like Gabby Lewis and all the Prendergast are going to have more of an opportunity to develop. Um, so I actually thought that there was some kind of real, really positive cricket played by them this tournament. Um, I think if you compare it to their previous World Cup, which was actually five years ago in 2018 in the Caribbean, um, they looked like they um, some of their players had developed a lot. Um, and they're less than a year into professional contracts for just a small number of players. Um, I think it's about seven players at the moment who have got full-time contracts. So, yeah, I thought um, overall kind of some positive signs for Ireland. And and they actually took West Indies really close in mm. that match. Um, so that was quite exciting. I think they West probably, Indies got over the... They probably should have won that game. Uh, I think they had a couple of chances probably when they were batting and, and when they were bowling. I mean, West Indies messed that last over up massively. I think a slightly more experienced team probably wins that game for Ireland. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that, but that's experience that they're going to get over the next few years because they are now in the um, ICC Women's Championships. That means they are they have got fixtures scheduled over the next few years in this World Cup, 50 over World Cup cycle against the top teams. So that's really positive for them. Uh, I would still say if these 10 teams stay with the, the lowest team. I know... That's, sometimes that's easy to say because they didn't have a win a game. But I would say that if you were doing a power rankings, you'd still have them pretty solidly 10th. Is that fair? It, it probably is, but I would say that they are hot on the heels of and, and actually kind of very well placed to potentially overtake teams like West Indies and Bangladesh in the next couple of years. Wow. Um, okay, Bangladesh, I thought they were okay. Um, you've just slagged them off and said that their women's team's terrible. Um, I thought they were quite organised. Um, I've been impressed with them a couple of times. I was impressed with them in the last World Cup as well. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say I saw individual players like the in the way I did with Ireland, where I was like, well, these players, I could see how they transfer into the franchise system and going ahead. But I thought as a squad, there was a little bit there for Bangladesh. Yeah, sure. And I think that they were kind of buoyed going into it by having performed well in the Under-19 World Cup. Um, and they, I think it was three of their players from that tournament were then in, in the main squad. Um, and they obviously famously um, pulled off that shock result um, in the opening match winning um, against Australia. Um, so I think that's really, that's really positive because it's kind of looking to the next generation and bringing them through um, in a way that perhaps um, some of the other teams um, maybe aren't doing quite so well. Yeah, yeah, I think I, – I, I just like the way they went about their cricket. Um, it, it's interesting. They've ended up with zero wins and Sri Lanka's ended up with two wins, but I'm not sure I thought there was that much of a difference. And if you look at that run rate, you would, it would suggest that they're very similar teams uh, from that perspective. But, um, I, I, no, I like what they did. Uh, Pakistan. So Pakistan got their one win over Ireland, um, uh, you know, a scratchy um, sort of win. I, I thought, again, these are the three worst teams. 
I mean, we could talk about Pakistan specifically as well, but if these are the three worst teams in this tournament. I think that's the strongest women's cricket has ever been at a tournament that I've seen in quite some time. Yeah, I think that's one of the key takeaways from the whole tournament is that um, what we are seeing now is some genuinely kind of exciting encounters and it not maybe being so predictable. And I guess we'll come to the, the semi-finals and the final in a minute. Um, but yeah, and obviously the big the big positive for Pakistan from this tournament was that Maniba Ali century um, becoming the first ever woman to, to hit um, a century um, for Pakistan in T20 cricket. Um, really exciting. And um, she's kind of definitely somebody who's going to be around for a few years and um, somebody to to look out for. So I think that they will have taken a lot just from that one individual performance. I'm just, I, I don't know as much about the history of um, of Pakistan women's cricket, but uh, you know I've read the book, which is called... Uh, what was the book that was written about Pakistan women's cricket? It's probably um, behind. Unveiling Jasper, I think. There we go. That's the one. I was going to say uh, uh, um, undealing, and undealing is not a word. Um, so I would have said that having watched them play, you know, a few World Cups now, batting is not really – they always have players who could chip in, but the fact that they have a player who can actually do that felt like a big step up. Yeah, definitely. Um, somebody who can kind of – Somebody who, to some extent, I mean, not maybe compared with some of the other nations, but somebody who is actually kind of adopting the power game a bit more. I think that's that's the crucial thing. And that's been sort of the difference between maybe some of the Pakistan batters and batters from other countries in at, at previous editions of the tournament. All right, that's bottom tier. We're done, we're done with the teams at the bottom. Uh, as we said, very, very good. Let's go to the, the next tier up, which is this sort of middling tier. Uh, let's go to West Indies. So they've ended up with two wins and two losses. Obviously, we know, uh, you know, they, they were missing one star player. Um, there was, uh, I, I'm not sure they were ever really in any danger of making the final. Oh, danger is the wrong word, but I, I never felt that they were in any, any real chance of, of pushing um, England or India out of the semifinal spots. Those were pretty solidly in there. Um, and that the end of that game against Ireland, I've already had to go at them about it once, but oh my God, that. That looked like that looked like school cricket. In fact, it looked almost as bad as that South Australia Tasmania game uh, the other day where someone <laughs> lost, lost five for Because you're watching it going, you cannot lose this game. And yeah. yet they went so close. Um, I think Hayley Matthews was batting, wasn't she? She took a single at one stage where I'm just like, why are you getting off strike? Just stay on strike and win this game. What are you doing? Yeah, well, and that, it's, it's difficult with Hayley Matthews because you so often feel that so much weight of expectation rests on her shoulders, being captain, being their best player, being, you know, knowing that um, if she does something wrong, then they're going to lose. Um, and so I guess that, you know, sometimes at crunch points, that is going to affect her mentally. And it looked like it maybe did in that in that game that you're talking about. Yeah. We're, um, we're going to get to Sri Lanka in a second. Right at the moment, if I said the next World Cup was in a year's time, who would you say is the better team? Sri Lanka. Yeah, uh, and I think that's a problem, isn't it? Because that does mean that the West Indies have dropped off um, a, a fair bit there. I, I, you know, not having another star player, um, obviously, you know, you know, we talk about all these South African players not at this tournament, but, you know, West Indies, this is their, you know, a major tournament also without one of their key players. It doesn't feel like they are producing that next generation of players. I, I watched the women's CPL and I thought there were some good cricketers in there, but I also didn't think that there was a lot of players where I was like, well, this is going to propel them back up into that upper upper tier which obviously they were in fairly recently yeah it's a really sad story actually in a way and I think I actually wrote during the tournament that it's a sort of case study of what happens when you win a world cup and then you don't bother to do anything to capitalize on it um because obviously they did that in 2016 and then since then it's just been kind of full, they've just fallen off a cliff um so it is really sad and um and yeah like in comparison with Sri Lanka who have actually got kind of some some young players um some exciting young players coming through so if you look at like Bishmi Gunaratne who's 17 um who had um one really good inning in this tournament um, and actually yeah you can kind of see where Sri Lanka are going to be in two or three years time whereas with West Indies you just think well are they actually going to be able to hang on to Hayley Matthews for much longer to be honest because how much are they going to be able to afford to pay her so that she doesn't just disappear off into franchise cricket um, and then who else have they actually got who's kind of coming through um, as you say to, to sort of replace her and take on that role yeah I mean the interesting thing is if you look 2012 to now the only player they've really added that is a world-class player is probably um Hayley Matthews to that and 
she's probably not quite as good as that one game made her look. Like, not to say she's not a good player, because she is a good player. But, you know, if, if, if you and I were doing this podcast in 2016, we were like, well, here's the future of cricket. This is incredible. It was actually, she probably still is there was their third best star even in that period, which is still great because it meant they had three stars. Mm -hmm. But there's been no replacements, right? It's literally a team that was carried by two women for a, a good chunk of time, then carried by three women. Now it's been carried by two women again. Yeah. You know, it's it's not ideal. Let's get on to Sri Lanka. So I would I would I'd have these two teams in a tier on their own. We'll get to New Zealand in a moment because I don't know what to do with them. But um <laughs> uh played really, really good cricket for two games. And then I felt like because no one had seen them play for a long time, uh, that the opposition video analysts got involved. Um, and, you know, a couple, of the, the, a couple of the stars from the better teams were looking at some footage and just going, oh, well, if we just do this, we'll be fine. That's okay. That, that, that shows that there is talent there and they have something to work on. Um, what, was, what was your thought on their tournament? Because they were a genuine semifinal chance at one stage. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think... It, it sounds a bit patronising, but even having that chance for Sri Lanka is just feels like that's a really big step forward compared with where they've been, compared with this kind they of... They didn't play cricket for how long? Um, it was about... nearly. It was nearly two years they played no international cricket between March 2020 and January 2022, I think it was. Um, yeah, and so that's... That that is such a uh, a ridiculous thing and a terrible thing to have happened to them, to be honest. Um, just to sort of be abandoned by the board during COVID. Um, so actually, you could say, well, they had their win because they beat South Africa. Um, and who would have predicted that ahead of this tournament? I'm not sure that many people would have, to be honest. Um, so I, I think you know the, the future's bright. Yeah, no, I I really like um, the way they played. I, I thought. It I just thought they ran out of steam a little bit and they caught people by surprise. If you look at their win-loss ratio, I think coming into this tournament, they were pretty poor. I think I, I looked up the numbers. We're not talking about a team, you know, when it was allowed to play that was particularly pushing on the door of a semi-final. So I thought it was absolutely huge for them. It's a, I think it's a big moment for Sri Lanka women's cricket because they have had other tournaments like this before where you're like, oh, wow, there's lots of players there. It was the last one, I'm trying to think, was it 2013? Yeah, that was where they beat England, which was did a huge story. Did they beat India in that tournament too? Uh, they did, yeah. I mean, that's, to, to think that in 2013 they beat England and India and in 2023 we're really excited that they rolled South Africa and Bangladesh is an odd thing to say, but this is in the middle of those two things. They just don't feel like they've really had a team. Well, it's about... How, what other nations have done in the interim? So in 2013, yeah. England didn't have professional contracts. Then the year after, they introduced them. And that's kind of led the way for other countries to do that, et cetera, et cetera. So, and now, um, you know, England and Australia are like streets ahead of everybody else. Um, so it's partly a story of what happens when you're good and you're competing, but then you stand still. Similarly to West Indies in a way, I think. Yeah. I think if we, I, even though I've got West Indies and Sri Lanka in the same tier, I think one would be arrowing up and one would be arrowing down. Yeah, um, that's it. It's different trajectories. Yeah. Um, next tier, I'm going to put New Zealand on their own. Um, what? Uh, it's a real shame that they decided not to bring batters for the first couple of games of this tournament. That seems like a mistake looking back on it. Um, is this the... I was trying to think back to the last one. There's so many World Cups now. I can't remember... We, I could be talking about the men at this point. There's so many World Cups in the last little while um, that I'm not even sure I'm thinking of the right one. Did they not start terribly in the previous World Cup as well, in the one-day World Cup in New Zealand? Um, did they start terribly? They didn't. They didn't have a very good World Cup overall. I'm trying to remember the trajectory. I know England had a very, very bad start to that to that World Cup. Um, it's it's a bit of a sleepless blur, to be honest, Jared, because I was <laughs> I was covering it from England and doing it overnight. So, <laughs> but they but they didn't have the desired outcome, certainly, because you know a home World Cup, you want to you want to do well, and they didn't. Um, so tell me tell me about them. I I saw the first two games and I decided to tune out because I was like, if you're not going to make any runs, um, I'm not going to be interested. So, would they bowled out for sixty and seventy? Is that right? It was it was low, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. Um, two kind of really hopeless games. Um, and it, so, I mean, that was against Australia, the first one. So maybe you can excuse that to some extent. Um, but then against South Africa, um, to, to be bowled out for 70 odd is, um, is, is quite a poor showing, I think. Um, and because you, you would kind of be expecting New Zealand and South Africa to sort of be on a par with each other. Um, and in that game, 
South Africa just totally rode all over them. Um, and I think one of the one of the problems this tournament has been that Sophie Devine has just looked totally out of sorts. Um, I was looking at her scores this tournament, so it was naught, 16, naught, and then three. Well, three not out in the last one. Um, so, you know, that's that's improved her average. Um, but <laughs> um, it's... They um they are still a team where they do rely on a few players with the bat, and she is one of them. Um, you know, sold for fifty lakh in the WPL auction, so is seen still as one of the best T Twenty players in the world in women's cricket, but just didn't really show up this tournament. Um, and you can tell when she's angry because she gets out, and you know she's always chewing gum. She chews gum more quickly. Um, so she's walking off and she's chewing really quickly and she knows that she's really stuffed up. Um, and they they were kind of like, they were sort of jiggling her up and down the batting order mm, as well, yeah. which is a big sign of um, when you're, like, of being in disarray, I think, you know, so she's opening and then she's coming at three and then they go, oh no, we better send her in at five so that we have somebody to do something when we've, you know, when we haven't made any runs in the first 10 overs and, and then she's at the crease within the first three overs anyway, because they've lost three wickets and it's just, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's been a tough one for New Zealand and I think they've copped quite a lot of flack from um, the, the media back home probably quite rightly to be honest because they um, would expect better of themselves I've looked at the last World Cup I was right West Indies beat them in that first game so oh yeah but it was very close it doesn't matter you, you, you're, you, this is the point they shouldn't be in a position where they are where they are starting tournaments so bad because women's cricket yeah. has changed right and you can't catch it up and I, I'm not sure it's interesting. We'll come on to um, we'll come on to South Africa later, but I'm not sure that New Zealand is that much worse than than South Africa. Um, and yet, uh, you know, they certainly didn't look like it in this particular tournament. I'll put them on a tier on their own, and then we get to the semi finalists because I'm not quite sure what to do with New Zealand at the moment. Um, who's the worst of the semi finalists? I kind of still feel like it's South Africa, and they've made the final, but I don't want to. I, I don't want to throw them in. Um, uh, and India didn't get that far away from Australia. Let's put England next, just for fun. Um, Tournament-wise, absolutely fine. I thought in that chase against South Africa that they just had the game completely within their grasp, but they never quite put it away. And um, they let South Africa... I almost felt like they let the crowd, which is not a big thing in women's cricket all the time, but it was in this particular tournament for South Africa, felt like they let the crowd get to them. And interestingly enough, we saw that twice because we saw Australia struggle when the South African crowd got up and running as well. Um, but they never quite got to a point where I was like, that England can't lose this, but they were very close a couple of times when I was thinking, this game's kind of over. Yeah, they started the chase really positively. But then again, um, there was a little <laughs> bit of kind of slightly loose fielding from South Africa. And you felt like, um, you know, they were on the cusp of taking a couple of Eng England wickets, um, even in that first five overs when they were really going at it. Um, there was a lot of luck involved, I think, in that um, in that um, 50 run partnership up top. Um, and so you always just kind of felt like if they make a breakthrough, it could all crumble. And then it did. Um, and I, I just feel like maybe um, you certainly, um, Sid and I were talking about this on the morning of the semi final. And I was like, yeah, England are going to walk it. It's going to be a total breeze. Um, they need to start thinking about that final against Australia. And I don't know whether any of that feeling would have kind of been going on within the camp. And obviously they wouldn't have admitted it if it had, but I, it just feels like maybe they had one eye on the final and forgot to think about the semi-final in front of them. They totally, they let South Africa get, um, you know, far too many runs, I think, on, on that pitch. Um, and obviously Tasman Britt's had an amazing day, um, you know, almost like a kind of once in a career day. Um, potentially it will be for her because she, I think she's, what, 30, 30 odd. Um, 32. Certainly, there you go. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a great day for her. Um, mm. Definitely one to remember, um, but maybe not what people would have been expecting. Um, and yeah, um, that, that it was weird the way that they, the way that Heather Knight just kept bowling the same bowlers and expecting, um, expecting something different to happen. I don't understand why she's so reluctant to bowl herself. Um, because on that pitch, it was much more um, likely that, I mean, just, just change it up a bit. Um, if if your spinners are all being um, knocked about, 
then give South Africa something else to deal with. But um, she said afterwards, oh, no, um, that was never in the plan, despite the fact that she's been bowling in the middle tournament before games. So I don't really understand that. So, yeah, um, in- England stuffed it up. Um, and But actually, that was great because it meant that we got a sellout at Newlands for the final. Yeah. And who would have expected to see that in South Africa? No, no, I, I think from a narrative point of view, it was great. It might also be the sort of thing that really helps England going ahead as well. Um, I thought they were quite an interesting team. They, you know, I've just done a big um, piece on how women don't attack as much in the power play and they generally attack a lot more in the middle. England is probably the team that is the opposite of that and is trying to break the power play. And it's not the first time they've done it. They did it in 2016 as well. So it's like, it doesn't matter who coaches the England women's team. They're always looking at it going, maybe we can be better in the power play. But yeah, I think you're right. I mean, you know, we'll get to Tasman in a minute when we talk about the, the, the final, but losing one wicket and what they put on about 150 runs um, at the start, like that's a huge, it doesn't feel like, it feels like England did something wrong. Although watching the game, I'm not sure I have that many notes on what they did wrong. The, the Heather Knight thing's really interesting, but um, that this is a kick in the teeth. I mean, you know, you you... South Africa making it to the final ahead of you, considering that South Africa didn't even pick their best team um, is and lost the first game to Sri Lanka is a real kick in the teeth. Yeah, and um, given that kind of seven months ago, South Africa were on tour in England and England were just absolutely hammering them in um, the whole of the white ball series um, and they just look like totally bereft of any answers um, and then this. And yeah, um, I think that there's going to be a lot of chat um within the England camp. Um, but they've definitely said that they're really still committed to this um what what we've been sort of calling John Ball um as a kind of tribute to Baz Ball because as you say they this is this this it's this kind of slightly new approach of really going hard at it from ball one um and just throwing the bat at everything um and not being so worried about getting out, I think. And so, that's uh, that's the uh, tactics. As someone who watches a lot more of the men's game than you do it makes a lot more sense in the men's game because they have quite often different kind of batting lineup. Like that, the, the strength of the men's team generally has been the middle order, right? So going very hard at the top means you're kind of with your weaker batters trying to make an impact. And if not, you know, then you have your, your strong middle order to maybe still save you. When did Catherine Brunt come out? Was she, did she bat at seven, eight? Seven, I think. And I, when she came out, I was like, oh, that's... You know, she was a very good number seven many, many years ago. I'm not sure she's quite at that level. And then was it Eccleston came out at eight? Is that, am I remembering the order right? I think so. Um... Because I was suddenly sitting there watching this going, that's not as strong. If you compare it to, say, Australia, where the batting goes a lot deeper, um, you know, it felt to me that if you're going to go strong at the top, you really want your core to be really, really strong, five, six, seven, eight. And that is not particularly how I see the England team. I think that England have, yeah, it's an interesting one. I just wonder whether they've just got used to Nat Siver Brunt just being there, um, kind of coming in at four and just scoring loads of runs and being the anchor and like not really getting out. Um, and therefore kind of underneath that, they're, they're not so concerned. And, and a lot of those players are not, um, had not had to bat. And, you know, like you've got Sarah Glenn coming out to try and hit um, however many it was off the last over, quite a few off the last over, um, when she's not really batted all tournament. Um, that was that was quite an ask of of her. Um, so I guess that England would say, well, our, our the strength, our strength, our strong middle order is um, Nat Siverbrand and Heather Knight. Although Heather Knight, again, tricky tournament for her with the bat. Actually, I think she will have been quite disappointed with her returns. Mm. No, I mean, there is a thing in, in T20 tournaments as well, especially the World Cups where you play, you know, five, six games at most, where if your top order is batting so well that your bottom order doesn't actually get a chance to find any groove. I'm not sure that's 100% what happened here because I actually think that there was a time when I would have been more than happy um, uh, for, uh, for Catherine. Siv- I, I, I've forgotten that it's a silver brunt now, isn't it? Just, um, her name, Don't worry. Her, so, <laughs> it's it's so annoying when you're trying to write a match report and you have to say their their entire name because you can't just say Siva exactly. Bronk because nobody knows who you mean. It, that I, I've actually made that complaint to my wife the other day. I said I've got no problem <laughs> with uh, players marrying each other within a team, but you have to understand it's more work for me now, and <laughs> yeah. I'm also going to also going to forget it. Also, I think one should have been Siva Brunt, one should have been Brunt Siva. That's yes. just. 
that's just an emotional thing. It doesn't actually make any sense from a family point of view, but from a cricket point of view, it's how my brain works. Um, so, so yeah, um, uh, yeah, it just, it didn't, it didn't feel as strong as we've seen other times. All right, so we've done England. India. I feel like I didn't see as much of India at this tournament. Obviously, I saw a bit of the semi-final. Um, I mean, the whole thing's a bit of a haze for me because of the time zones I've been on. Um, but it felt like India w- made it through fairly easy. That is the easier of the group. Um, if you have a look at that group, West Indies is the third best team, whereas you could make a play that, you know, uh, West Indies would be the fourth or fifth best team um, in the other group, for instance. So it was a much, much easier group. I feel like India sort of cruised through, but that semi-final, they were in the game, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, India did lose to England in the group, so that's why that's why they ended up um, facing Australia in the semi-final. So that was always the thing with um, England and India's group, was which one of you is going to be runner up in the group and have to face Australia in the semi-final rather than the final. Um, so yeah, the, so India semi-final, um, some sloppy fielding really. Um, and it was a quite a strange game of cricket actually, because you just felt like neither team played anything like their best. And yet it was still a really kind of close, compelling game. Um, and probably that t- the turning point is that home pre call run out, um, which I know people have kind of said talk talk about it in different ways, but she basically got her bat stuck, and it was a bit unlucky. I think um, you know, such is um, such is cricket; it can hinge on very strange, um, unfortunate moments. Um, and the way that she then like chucked her bat across the pitch, um, and actually, it was interesting talking to Megan Shu after the final, and she said, "Well, she shouldn't have done that because it gives the indication to everyone coming in underneath her that the game's already dead." that she knows that she's got out and that's the end of it. And that's not what you want to be giving the impression to people because they did still have a chance when she got out, if they really went at it. Um, But then they know that their captains sat there thinking, no, I've got out and that's it. Yeah, that's a very Australian answer uh, from uh, from, uh, Megan Schubert. (laughs) So um, I'm not completely surprised that she would think that. I'm going to just say something. The game... uh, they they ran Australia within it was a five runs. They ran England within eleven runs. Right, the Island game, which I did see almost all of all of, I think they probably should have lost that. Right, if, if forget DLS, I still think they had it. They I was watching them back, just going, they are keeping Ireland in this game, and Ireland are not that far away here. Uh, the DLS thing with Ireland, we've already discussed. We don't really know how they didn't understand math- um, mathematics at that point. It's not even <laughs> mathematics, is it? Just reading the, the the table correctly. They lost a couple of quick early wickets, which which did play it. So here's my point. They played pretty well against Australia and England, but actually played really poorly against um, Ireland. Where is the Indian team? Was that just, do we just throw the Ireland game away, even though that, you know, um, you know, they won it, but do we just say, they weren't. They probably just thought Ireland wasn't as good, and maybe got a little bit shocked by how good Ireland is. Or is there still a way to go for the Indian team before they get to that level that Australia and England are on? I think that compared with Australia, certainly Australia are totally consistent, and India are still inconsistent, and inconsistent in the way where they bring their best cricket generally in the big matches, and then maybe mm. some of the other matches they. Um, are a little bit are a little bit laxer in a way that Australia wouldn't be um, wouldn't really get away with. So Australia like going well, we're going to beat like Bangladesh by ten wickets because we can, um, and it doesn't matter that we could just kind of be a bit lazier about it. Whereas you just feel like with India, so India actually I believe lost to Sri Lanka in a T20 last year. Um, a, f- a few months ago and you go well hang on that on paper that doesn't stack up at all because india are a way better team um but then that there is something um with th- with this indian team there is something about that where they go okay well we we sort of take our foot off the gas a little bit when we think that the game doesn't really matter so much um so that's why you see them kind of i think doing well generally in like big matches and then some of the other results you go oh that was a bit close or that was a bit of a strange one mm. this is why i think it matters because I do think that England and Australia are, let's say for the next three years, four years, are going to be consistently good and are going to be too good for any of the mediocre teams. You only need New Zealand, Sri Lanka, South Africa, you know, whoever else to get good, even a 50-50 win team at that point. And suddenly semifinal spots are getting trickier and trickier to pick up, right? 
And we've already seen with New Zealand how a couple of bad losses can really affect you early on in a tournament. And so, yeah, I just think it's probably, I don't want to say it's an experience thing, but I think that they're not, I don't think they're as competitive or match hardened as they should be game in and game out. Um, I, I don't think they planned correctly for Ireland. And I think they were a bit shocked that Ireland were as good as they were. To be fair, I think they had played Ireland after Ireland had played England when, um, Ireland were basically bowling underarm in that game. So there is a possibility if they saw any footage of that, they were like, well, this, this, mark that one down as a win, everyone, and let's just, we'll head <laughs> off to the next one. Um, I would say that England and India are better than South Africa mm-hmm. and that South Africa had a very good tournament. And obviously, um, you know, they, I mean, they won two and lost to South Africa and then won the semi final. And so it looks better because uh, they, they won the semi final. Um, the, the Sri Lanka game was an embarrassment. Um, I thought they had many t- chances to win that. Looked like they completely crumbled under the pressure of that particular game. Uh, you know, they then they beat New Zealand. That like they they came back very strongly in the next game. Absolutely smashed New Zealand. Then Australia um, smashed them. And then over the last couple of games, then you've got them easily beating um, a Bangladesh and then the England game. It's not an easy form line on South Africa to read. Yeah, it's not. But I think that we maybe underestimate the impact of playing at home from a kind of from a I mean, we talk you talked about the crowd um, lifting them at key moments, but there's that pressure as well of playing at home. And I think that we did see that in 2020 in the last T20 World Cup with Australia, because they didn't have a particularly straightforward route to the final. We think about that moment at the end at the MCG, but actually Australia kind of, you know, came within um, a like it looked at one point like it wasn't a sure thing that they were going to get there. Um, So I think that we actually saw similar with South Africa, such immense pressure of being in the home World Cup, of knowing that getting to the semi-finals um, even would be such a kind of potential way to progress women's cricket within South Africa that put a lot on them. Um, And also then they have all that scrutiny of just before the tournament Danae van Neerkirk gets left out of the squad and there's su- there's suddenly loads of people looking at them and going, well, that's odd. And looking at Sune Luce in particular and going, well, why on earth are you the captain? Um, and I think that she actually spoke um, before and after the final about how difficult she'd found that um, from a personal perspective, just not feeling like it was really her team. And what I thought was really great was um, in that final, it did really feel like it did really look like she now felt that it was her team and she did have a bit more confidence and an ability to go, okay, I'm going to move that fielder over there and I'm going to really put my stamp on this team in a way that um, she probably found quite difficult even early on in this tournament, knowing that everyone was, was, as I say, looking at her going, well, you're not done, Avan Nierkert. I'm going to throw a really, really interesting conundrum at you and I don't think that's an answer, but it's what I like to do to you. Tasman Brits got them through to the final, right? But Lizelle Lee still would have been a better player in that position. And it was very evident in the final that Tasman Brits was someone who came to cricket late and with slightly smarter cricketers bowling uh, who had seen her make runs in the previous game. They just put balls in difficult situations and her innings has probably cost them the final. I, this is not going, Tasman Brits costs... Uh, I, but what I mean is... They were so far behind so early on because she, her, of her inability to be able to. And it wasn't that she wasn't, it wasn't like a, a, um, uh, a Lendl Simmons innings or, you know, uh, a Jinky Rahani innings. She wasn't just chipping the ball around um, or anything. She was trying to hit it. It's that she's a very, li- very limited player. I, if I was working in South African cricket right now, I'd be really excited by what has happened. But what I would be saying is we were lucky to make the final. We were then basically had a couple of players make us look even better in the final than we probably deserve to look. Um, we are still a long way away from, I think, the top three teams. I would almost have South Africa still in a tier with New Zealand rather than having them with England, Australia, and um, uh, India. Wow, there's a lot in that, Jared. Yep. Um, I so think if they've you could just be explain careful. all of that. <laughs> cause... I think they've got to be careful not to get carried away um, because... As you say, they're not necessarily kind of fully in that top tier. I think the hope would be that having got to the World Cup final, there now will be that increased investment forthcoming from Cricket South Africa. 
Um, and I think that that's really important in order to try to sort of make sure that um, they are competing in future tournaments. Um, in terms of what you said about Brits versus Lizelle Lee, I, I guess you could equally say, well, they wouldn't have been in the final if it wasn't for Tasman Brits. That's why it's a conundrum. Yeah. I, and I, I will say, though, I think they're really missing um, a kind of a, a Lizelle Lee behind the stumps. Um, yeah. It's the the wicket keeping that's that's maybe um, <laughs> that that doesn't look great for them at the moment. So um, it's that where they're missing her perhaps more than with the bat. Yeah, no, there was some bad wicket keeping. Um, let's let's be honest, there was some very bad wicket keeping. She doesn't. Uh, what's her wicket keeper's name? I've forgotten her name now. Uh, Sonalo Jafta. She doesn't line up correctly at times. She just doesn't seem to put herself in the right positions. Um, she doesn't keep her hands low. Uh, she doesn't always bend her knees correctly. It, she looks like a makeshift wiki keeper um, who, who's been thrown in there. So, yeah, I, look, look, there are some very good signs. Laura Wolfart is probably the player that we all thought she was going to be when she was young and she was magnificent, um, you know, but the, that that senior bowling core is aging every year. Um, yeah. And you kind of eventually, the, and also the lack of spinners. Um, I like Malaba as a, as a second or third spinner. But when she's kind of your main and only option, she's a very she's nowhere near the level of spin that you're seeing in England and India and Australia and New Zealand at the moment. Um, so yeah, no, I, I was a little bit um, a, a little bit like, oh, it's great that they've made it, and I think you're right. Hopefully, they will take that and build something off it. But I, it reminds me of when I worked with Melbourne Stars. We made the we, we last one year, and then we made the final the next year, and the franchise was cock a hoop. And I was like, yeah, let me take you through all the weird things that had to happen for us to make the finals. Um, and then we made the finals when we were fourth, and then we beat the first team, which is again a random thing to have happen. Um, we were not as good as we thought we were. Uh, we really need to change a lot of things here. I'm hoping there's someone within the South African camp saying the same thing. Oh, it's great. And the, and the crowd, and we almost beat Australia and everyone was there. And see, Khaleesi was singing songs for us and all this sort of stuff. But also be like, we probably can't go into another tournament with a wiki keeper that bad and an opening batter who can't uh, rotate the strike when she's in trouble. So I, I think it's worth uh, from that point of view. I thought Australia played a very bad final and it just doesn't matter because... They're just so much better. I, so I compared them to the dream team and you obviously are probably not as, uh, as big an expert on 1992 men's basketball um, as I am. But the thing with the dream team was that even if you had the opportunity to put any pressure on the dream team and say Charles Barkley, who was the best player in the dream team, was playing power forward. If he's having a bad day or you manage to mitigate what he's doing, all you're doing is then bringing the second best power forward in the world off the bench. So if you've managed to work out one of them, you won't manage to work out two of them. And if you look at this, um, I, I would have said that I, I'm not sure I would have bowled Georgia Wareham two overs. I thought her first over was a bit ropey. And Tali McGrath, again, I'm not. they didn't even need to bowl these people. It was at a point where it felt like they were just like, It'd be, it's going to be a bit silly if you play in this World Cup and we don't do anything with you. So why don't you bowl a couple of overs just in the middle? Um, and that's how they bowled those overs as well. But from a... You know, we, I just did this whole big series on the uh, on the Indian men's team and how their biggest problem is problem solving, right? Because they don't, they've got all this incredible talent, but they don't play it in a way where you can just go, oh, we're going to go with this direction or this direction. Or we're going to try this lineup. The Australian women's team is actually living that perfectly where they can problem solve every single uh, situation because they have so many, they basically have eight frontline batters and eight frontline bowlers and the the two best wicket taking um, T20 bowlers in the world didn't play in their final eleven, right? You know, Amanda Jade and Alana were both not in the well. One's not even on the squad. That the quality of depth and what they could throw at you, and even when South Africa got in front, you're just like, yeah, but they're going to bowl Ashley Gardner or Jess Johnson now. So yeah, yeah you've you've hit Georgie where uh, uh, George Ware him a couple of times here, but now. Um, you're just going to have to somehow try and score against M Megan Shoot and Jess Jonathan at the death at 10 or 12 runs and over. You're not going to do that. So what are we even getting excited about here? Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly that. It was, it, yeah, it just felt like, and as you say, it was the the first the first six overs just cost them that, like 22 runs off the power play. 
Um, but I do think I do think some of that is down to Australia bowling so well, rather than South Africa being absolutely clueless. I mean, oh, they yeah, knew yeah. that they needed to they knew they needed to score at a faster run than run rate than that. Um, but it's exactly like Beth Mooney said in the press conference afterwards. I actually said to her, "Let's say in a kind of theoretical world, you were being paid to advise um, another team on how to beat Australia. What would you say?" She was like, "Oh." Um, it's a hard question, but I'd probably just say, don't turn up, just don't bother, because you're not going to win. <laughs> I mean, and she it, was kind of she was kind of joking, but she's also right. Yeah, I don't know how you game plan against them. If you look at that final, it'd be interesting to see if they played that poorly against England or India, how it would have gone. But if you look at that final, I didn't think they batted particularly well, Australia. I didn't think they bowled particularly well. And they fielded dreadfully. And yet, they've ended up quite easily winning that game. I mean, South Africa you know, between the, what, the 12 and the 16 over mark were scaring them, but they were scaring them from a distance back, right? It was, it was the crowds on our side and, you know, the wolf sitting a couple of sixes here and maybe something can happen. But even then she would have had to bat to almost the last ball for them to even get close. Yeah, exactly. Exactly that. And I think I actually tweeted earlier on in the tournament, um, it was their game against New Zealand. Uh, and obviously they ended up bowling New Zealand out for 60 odd. So it was irrelevant. But um, it felt like New Zealand actually bowled quite well and were taking wickets regularly. And then you look at after 20 overs and Australia have somehow, somehow put 170 on the board. I how remember they, that how game. have they done that? Um, and then it was the same in this, you know, they... They were, yeah, they, they did some weird things with the batting order. They were sort of moving people around and they were losing regular wickets and South Africa were holding on to some really good catches. Um, and then you go, oh, but hang on, they've got 156 and that's going to be really quite difficult for South Africa to chase down on this pitch. But it just feels like even when you think, oh, they're not having a good day, they actually somehow are. <laughs> yeah. No, no, you're right. I remember that game and watching it really closely and thinking Australia had batted poorly. And then again, it, I didn't even see your tweet because I remember I was I was cooking a Sunday roast. And so I was watching it and cooking it at the same time. And I was like, I was really frustrated with how they were batting. And then, you know, closing the innings, you sort of look at it and you go, oh, well, they've won this. I mean, they've scored, you know, 170 or whatever. And the same here again with the, with the you know, the 150 odd. I think if they were, that's where I think it would have been interesting if they batted exactly the same against India or England, just because South Africa just can't score. 145 plus against the Australian lineup. There's too many options again. I thought that even before the game, before the innings, I should say, but it, it sort of played out this way that basically uh, the Wolf was going to have to go, you know, the 18th or 19th over to be able to get there. And the fact that she almost got that far and that was the only time they were in the game, there's a big difference between her and everyone else. But Australia is still really good. Um, as, a, as a person who covers women's cricket, at what so, so when the Australian men's team was really good, and we're about to probably have a similar thing with the Indian men's team, perhaps entering a similar kind of era, there's this idea that it's really bad for the game, that one team's really good. But I would counter that with the fact that when the West Indies men's team were really good and when the Australian men's team were really good, it actually it gives you everyone a common enemy. It means that casual fans instantly know the narrative. They don't have to go, who's who's playing good at the moment? Who, who's who's coming into this tournament? Um, pretty pretty good, right? The narrative is there. The big bad wolf is there, um, and it also means that you don't have a choice. You you can't you can't be South Africa now and go, oh, well, we made the final. No no no, you made the final, but you still lost by twenty runs when the other team didn't even play that good against you. Um, uh, I actually think it's still a good thing but i can understand why everyone doesn't agree with my theory on that it's a good thing if it inspires other nations and other other boards to look at what cricket australia have done and go we want some of that success for us so we need to emulate that and that's what you hope will happen um, and to some extent it is happening because i think that for example um you know things like the hundred in um, in England, a response to the success of the WBBL and going, okay, well, we need some of that for our women's domestic structure um, and the moves towards professionalisation of the English women's domestic structure have kind of come about as a result of Australia's success and sustained success, because that's where it's come from. It's about investment and it's about investment all the way through the system. And so you're now hoping that with the WPL, um, that will happen in India and that their domestic structure will get stronger. There's been a lot of conversation about how to improve New Zealand's domestic structure after they've been so poor this tournament. Um, and I guess now after South Africa reaching the final, the conversation is about what do you do underneath the national team? What do Cricket South Africa do to improve the situation in South Africa? 
So countries are looking to Australia and going, right, how can we be better? And of course, it's going to take a while because um, the gap is now wide because Australia have got a massive head start on everyone else. But if it happens, if it helps to change the situation in other countries to improve the investment in other countries, then it's a good thing for women's cricket. Yeah. It's just a bit annoying. It's just a bit annoying you know, while it's happening, that's all. I mean, yeah, I mean, definitely. Um, uh, it's it's interesting having a space race where only one person has a rocket. Um, <laughs> and that's kind of where we are at the moment, right? And, and WPL and the 100 might change things there. And maybe New Zealand will... I mean, New Zealand did absolutely brilliant to re um, rehabilitate their men's team right? Maybe they can come up with an equally interesting way of doing it on, on the women's side as well. So um, I've got an idea about what New Zealand should do. Um, become a state of Australia. In- <laughs> oh, well, sort of. Instead of trying to think about their own domestic league, they should just go, okay, we're going to have two more teams in WBBL and they're going to both be, and there's, one's going to be a North Island and one's going to be a South Island team. Yep. And that's, that's what you do. Um, so then, and then they get to piggyback on the success of the WBBL rather than trying to start another franchise competition that competes with all of the ones that are existing at the moment, which frankly the system can't sustain. Mm -hmm. Look, the thing is, I've been saying this for years, probably since the Big Bash got big, the Super Smash or whatever it's called these years, the men's T20, I think it's the same for the women's, isn't it? It's just, yeah. um, yeah. Um, It's never going to go anywhere, right? It has a natural ceiling. So you might as well start doing that. And I also think that that is something you could still have a a professional low-level competition, maybe for three months of the years where all your local players are playing and all that sort of stuff. But then you have an elite system. I don't know how much you know about um, West uh, West Indies. Where are we? New Zealand sport. But, um, you know, they have professional teams that play in um competitions in australia already so you know in basketball and in um rugby league i think as well and i'm probably missing a couple of others maybe i'm not sure if the netball does as well but there's a few other things and for me it makes a lot more sense it also makes a lot more sense for cricket to have one big tournament um doing stuff like that and 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 going ahead with it from that perspective um I don't think that's where New Zealand is looking, but that's certainly where I would be looking at doing as well. I think that's a much better way of doing it. And then you have your your local co- competition is then just purely a development league, right? Um, we have professionals here. They're playing all year round, but the best players are going on into this major tournament and then we're picking from the international teams um, from, from that perspective. Um, well, we fixed it, so that was easy. Uh, Raph Nicholson, <laughs> thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me.